In the Victorian era, England's northern towns and cities experienced nothing short of an architectural transformation. In a golden age of civic architecture, the North created buildings that expressed the fashions and the philosophies of the day. But behind the grand facades, there are human stories, personal conflicts, private passions, lives and loves set in stone. These civic buildings were bankrolled by proceeds from the Industrial Revolution, which turned modest market towns into vast modern cities. The manufacturing towns of northern England were the frontier to the world's industrialised cities, but there was no road map for any of this. It would take characters of exceptional conviction to step forward and harness the opportunities of the modern age. It was they who rebuilt the north of England for a new industrialised way of life. Their ideas were brave and visionary, and for better or for worse, we're still living with their legacy. When northerners first grew rich from the fruits of industry, they furnished their towns with neoclassical buildings to educate and enlighten. But as the 19th century wore on, they tired of this formal elegance. By the height of the Victorian age, a very different aesthetic, Gothic, would capture hearts and minds. Its freedom and versatility would redefine urban landscapes right across the north. This is the Temple of Liberty at Stowe House in Buckinghamshire, built from 1741 for the parliamentarian Richard Temple. It's perhaps a surprising place to start a story about northern civic architecture. But it was in garden follies like this that Gothic, a style born in the 12th century, was relaunched, first playfully by 18th century aristocrats, then seriously by social reformers, and then ubiquitously by Victorian architects as their civic style of choice. Gothic style is both hard and easy to define. It's hard because even in the Middle Ages, Gothic style kept evolving. A 12th century Gothic building doesn't look much like a 15th century one, for example. And they change from place to place, so florid Spanish Gothic is different to French tall Gothic to broad English Gothic. The Temple of Liberty is Gothic by virtue of having a pointed arch. That's the central motif of Gothic style. The rest is just variations on its theme. When Gothic was rediscovered in the 18th century, its very flexibility, the fact that a Gothic arch had no fixed proportion but could be as broad or as tall as you wanted, gave creative designers a sense of new potential. It gave patrons the idea that they could reflect themselves and their own image, not in Mediterranean classical history, but in the nation's own history. Whilst the Temple of Liberty looks playful, it carried serious overtones of ancient British political freedoms. But into the Victorian era, Gothic became the vehicle for a new awakening of social conscience. The style would then be eagerly adopted by the urban, industrial north. At the beginning of the 19th century, Manchester was a market town. But within 50 years, it would become the world's first industrialised city. Cotton made modern Manchester. It became the bustling hub of Lancashire's lucrative cotton trade.
But there was a social price to pay for this progress. Manchester's population increased sixfold in 60 years. Its residents faced deafening mills, smog-ridden streets, and a life expectancy of just 26 years. As one visitor put it, from this filthy sewer, pure gold flows. The Victorians came to believe you could judge the health of a society by its built environment. When many saw the grimy conditions of the industrial north with factories and slums, they had real cause for concern. How could they fail to conclude that their society was in serious decline? More to the point, what could they do about it? What became known as the condition of England question gave politicians and social reformers alike many a sleepless night. Industrial cities had never existed before, so no one knew how to deal with their problems. The issue of cynical, insanitary, jerry-built slums met with a raft of bylaws, for this was not yet an age of mass social housing. Instead, it would be civic architecture, which would affect the moral tone. And in seeking a new, brighter future, the Victorians looked to the past. Medieval ecclesiastical architecture travelled through the ages to provide a blueprint for Victorian town planners and architects. One evangelical young man would start an architectural revolution that would change the face of towns and cities across the north. Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin was a colourful character. By the time he was 21, he'd already been shipwrecked, bankrupt and widowed twice. He had this rather peculiar education. He learned about architecture travelling with his father and his father's drawing pupils. And he learned about architecture by measuring it, climbing over it, digging round it. Pugin and his father, um, for example, trying to work out how a vault was held up, just um, bored a hole through the top and lowered actually some of the smaller drawing school pupils inside and told them to draw what they could see. A boy-sized hole in a vault. Yeah, a boy-sized hole in a vault. Um, they found it quite difficult to get them out afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pugin went around filling these sketchbooks um, and very typically, not only just picking on the details, but he's got belfry windows very good. He was mm. singling out the things he liked. He's a real magpie brain for detail, isn't he? Yes. And, and careful with it. Yes. Gradually, he begins to assemble all this, you see. And so he's restoring the churches in his imagination as they were before the Reformation, before the statues were smashed, before the stained glass was spoiled. And so gradually, you can see his view of the Middle Ages changing from a view of history uh, to a manifesto for the present and for the future, something he's going to rebuild and recreate. And so the uses of the past, this wasn't ne ne necessarily seen as a retrogressive thing. He was no. actually very forward-looking in the way that the ingredients from the past created a new recipe for the future. Well, he and his whole generation, I think probably the 1840s was the last time until the 1960s that the whole of Europe was driven by the, young, the youngest rising generation. And they were revivalists, but in the most positive kind of sense, that they wanted to reanimate the present using the past. They simply wanted to, wanted to revive what felt like rather a tired, stale, anxious society. And they saw in the Middle Ages the material to do it. In his most influential work, Contrasts, Pugin compared an imaginary medieval town with the same place in the 19th century. These sketches show how Pugin idealized medieval society. The prominent spires symbolize the harmonious and godly community whilst in the soulless Victorian city, industry and commerce reign, and factories dominate the skyline. Powerful pictures, how was it received? It was received very enthusiastically. Suddenly they realised that all the questions that were being put about the city, about the condition of England, and this boring architecture they were doing, you could put these two things together. Architecture could be a social force. No one had thought like that before, so it was immensely influential. Pugin popularised the medieval past as an architectural template and social manifesto for the future. 
The message was particularly pertinent in the urban, industrial north. Like Manchester, Leeds had been transformed by the Industrial Revolution. By the 1830s, it boasted over a hundred woolen mills, employing nearly 10,000 people. St. Peter's, the town's Protestant church, was run down and the size of its congregation was pitiful. Enter a dedicated churchman, Walter Farquhar Hook. Hook shared Pugin's belief in the improving influence of architecture. On becoming vicar of St. Peter's, he had the church remodeled in elevating Gothic style. The rebuild was funded by the local council, but in true public spirit, Hook took a cut in his salary and moved to a smaller parsonage, making a personal contribution too. The revamped St Peter's was the biggest church to be built in Britain since St Paul's Cathedral. But would it be enough to revitalize Leeds' ailing Anglican community? St Peter's Leeds is a million miles from a plain Georgian preaching box. It's a radical building, but nonetheless it's one which managed to find a compromise between high and low church. Chantrell, the architect, had listened to Pugin. You can see how the structure, this stonework, which is learned from York Minster itself, a product of the English Catholic Middle Ages, has ornament which is integrally related to the structure. It's a serious and scholarly exercise. That big west window with the stained glass is obviously looking back seriously at medieval precedent. But you look at the pews, 700 of these were given over to parishioners, so it democratised church attendance. You didn't have to pay a rent to sit here. You did upstairs. It's a different matter, up a special staircase. But these pews are largely confections in the Puginian way that ornament should be related to the structure. This is ornament for ornament's sake and it's not scholarly anymore. You wouldn't find these galleries in a medieval church and the ornament is made with papier-mâché. It's all sort of added on and less than serious. You get the sense that Chantrell might hope one day, they'd simply be taken away. And then there is the East End. You have both a pulpit where the low church word is being preached and then the East End elevated on a platform where the, the Catholic rites might be reenacted. It appeals to both sides. By achieving this compromise, it's an incredibly important building for the development of Victorian church architecture. Hook's impact on Leeds was remarkable. His charismatic sermons attracted standing room only crowds. As one congregation member recorded, September 1856, went to parish church, but could not get in, was full. But Hook's influence went beyond the walls of St. Peter's. He fought for the education of children across the parish and backed the construction of 30 schools. Hook and the church he built were a shining example of how Pugin's principles could revitalize a community. The vogue for medievalism, combined with concern about the architectural health of the nation, would see Gothic move beyond ecclesiastical architecture to become a suitable style for the North's great civic structures too. It was a chance event which occurred one sunny evening in 1834 that eased Gothic's passage from the sacred to the secular.
a fire broke out in the Palace of Westminster and quickly took hold. Huge crowds watched from Westminster Bridge and from the boats that packed the river. Pugin was there too, delighting in the fact that the work of his more modern rivals, people like James Wyatt, were falling apart. The sash windows were going up in flames, whilst in a valedictory display, the genuine medieval fabric stood intact, a testament to the builders Pugin so admired. Within hours, the site was a smouldering wreck. Britain needed a new parliamentary building, and the style most in keeping with the original framework was Gothic. A competition was launched to design a new Palace of Westminster. The winning submission was a collaboration between Pugin and the celebrated architect Charles Barry. Building started in 1840, but Pugin was not satisfied. Pugin criticised the design they'd put together. He thought it was nothing more than a classical design with gothic detail just added onto the surface, however brilliant. I think that's unfair. What was achieved ultimately was the result of compromise, which gothic as a style ultimately was equipped to allow for. Barry studied the town halls of northern Europe. He changed his original flat roof to a pitched one. He wanted to make this a fireproof palace, one fit for the future. And so the new pitch roof has cast iron slates on the top. The design for the heating system by one Dr. Reed created pinnacles and towers everywhere for air circulation, and that practicality gave the building a more picturesque pinnacle skyline than had at first been imagined. It's ultimately the balance of the horizontals and the verticals which makes this one of the great picturesque buildings of the world. So it was that Gothic, once the preserve of churches and the occasional folly, became a national style, a public principle, and the face of the British government. But the fact that the northern cities eventually embraced Gothic for their own civic structures owed much to the influence of another man. The eminent writer, art critic, and enthusiastic medievalist, John Ruskin. The city of Venice was awash with Gothic architecture, and it was here that Ruskin's young wife, Effie, brought her husband to inject some romance into their as yet unconsummated marriage. Unfortunately for Effie, Ruskin was more interested in the architecture than he was in her. In the crumbling Gothic facades, with their individual craftsmanship, Ruskin sensed free, creative spirit, something he felt was absent in the dull regularity of contemporary English architecture. When Ruskin published these influential ideas in The Stones of Venice, it elevated Gothic into a full-on political program. It may seem odd to have chosen southern, sunny, decaying Venice as a touchstone for Victoria's burgeoning industrial Britain, but in its original fabric, Ruskin saw the genius of freedom. This was a radical work. He says the Gothic spirit not only dared but delighted in the infringement of every servile principle. Venice was once emancipated, and Britain could be now. The Stones of Venice is a manifesto for freedom. Pugin's Gothic had been closely linked to the church and godliness, but Ruskin's book secularised the style. This allowed northern civic architects to embrace it and make it their own. In Manchester, a local lad, Thomas Worthington, became a leading exponent of the style. His imposing design for the city police courts features a bell tower like some great Italian cathedral. When it was first built, the red brick must have stood out brightly against the sooty buildings of the industrial city. The middle of the 19th century witnessed what became known as the Battle of the Styles, a passionate debate between the supporters of Gothic architecture 
and those who favoured neoclassicism. In Manchester, unlike Liverpool, Gothic triumphed. The city's wealthy industrialists preferred its warm, idiosyncratic charm to the cool purity of classicism. Edward Salomons, Manchester's most prominent Jewish architect, felt the same, or at least his clients did. Salomons Reform Club is a romantic Gothic building and one of the largest surviving provincial clubhouses in the country. Manchester was now a city at the height of its economic powers and it was ready to redefine itself architecturally and culturally too. It's a tall order, isn't it, to be the first industrialised city in the world and have to make it up as you go along. There's no roadmap. This um, is part of this, this radical new society, that they're making it up as they go. And the great thing about Manchester men is they don't mind that. They say, oh, we'll just kind of do it, we'll see, we'll build this, and um, this is what I think it should look like, what do you think? And because the people in control in Manchester economically are also those who become in control politically and culturally, they can do anything they like. Um, we're talking about a group really... Of, of maybe just 15 or 20 men who are the real power brokers in Manchester and they are the people who form the town council, who become involved in forging a very new idea of what local government is about and it really is about the ideas of a few men and we tend to now think, oh that sounds terribly dangerous, just a few people in control of this enormous city and, um, but actually in Manchester it worked because they, they were very well in tune with what Manchester had become because they were part of it and some of them really had climbed up from that initial urban migrant status to be real Manchester men. So who were the leading Manchester men? My personal favourite <laughs> uh, is William Fairburn, the engineer, particularly because uh, along with his son Thomas Fairburn they, they span you know, two generations of influence in Manchester and Fairburn really typifies the, the Manchester man because he's interested in politics. He's philanthropic in terms of, you know, 1840s, 1850s. He's very forward thinking and he loved Manchester. He was absolutely committed to his location. He proposed the building of a single chimney for all the Manchester factories that would be uh, like kind of an obelisk in the sky. And this he thought would, would solve two problems. It would get the smoke away from the buildings, which everyone's complaint about Manchester was it was dirty and smoky. And the other thing, it would produce this massive monument to industry. It would be a celebration of industry and bring people to Manchester to look at the spectacle. That kind of connection between town and commerce and culture are the three kind of points of the triangle. You can't just make money, you've got to make your name. William Fairbairn's great chimney never really stacked up, but his son Thomas came up with a better way to attract visitors to Manchester and relaunch the city of commerce, a city of culture. What was needed, Thomas Fairbairn decided, was an art exhibition. But not just any art exhibition, it would be the largest art exhibition Britain had ever seen. The aim was to elevate the hearts and minds of working men by exposure to the improving influence of art. The idea quickly gained momentum. The great and the good were asked to contribute to a fund and within weeks, £74,000 had been raised. All they needed now was somewhere stylish to put on the show. A competition was launched for a building which would cover 15,000 square yards would take no more than six months to build and would cost no more than £25,000. The exhibition pavilion was a modern structure of iron, brick and glass. The design has been attributed to the architect Francis Folk, who built the Royal Albert Hall in London. By the time the exhibition opened in 1857, the committee had cajoled a thousand lenders to donate 16,000 artworks everything from paintings and sculpture to antiques and armour.
The response was tremendous. A new railway station had been built with a platform 800 feet long, and they needed it because manufacturers from rival cities brought thousands of their workers to come and see Manchester's great spectacle. Everybody flocked to see this building. Manchester, since Victoria had visited, was now a city under royal patronage, and Prince Albert was very interested and involved in this process. Even Engels, the Marxist, wrote to Karl Marx and, and said <laughs> that Marx should bring his family here to have a look at it. Everyone came. In fact, 1,300,000 people came. And the Times reported that Manchester quite rivaled the attractions of the capital. The exhibition showed the world that Manchester was no longer the cottonopolis of the industrial age. It had matured into a city of culture. But Manchester wasn't the only northern town keen to prove its cultural credentials. Following a series of parliamentary acts in the 1830s, which increased the powers of local government, towns needed somewhere to house their growing council departments. This produced some healthy competition amongst the northern towns, as each tried to outdo its neighbour with the most impressive town hall. The Industrial Revolution had turned Rochdale into a wealthy mill town with a reputation for radicalism and social progress. Ruskin damningly described it as a place where nothing of artistic value could ever come. But Rochdale would prove Ruskin was wrong. Rochdale's town hall is the result of one local visionary's determination to put his town on the map. Councillor George Ashworth fought against any cost-cutting measures that would detract from the architect William Crossland's ambitious design, even when it was suggested the money could be better used for a new town sewerage system. Crossland's building, with its pointed arches, clustered pillars and pinnacled gables, transformed a marshy riverbank into a romantic, gothic plaza. The Rochdale Observer heartily supported the choice of this preeminently English style. Besides, the paper continued, it must be remembered that gothic style affords the most ample scope for outside decoration. That is not just a pretty facade. The entrance hall is a forest of low arches on columns with lots of sculpture and a great deal of colour, which seems to come straight from Ruskin's recipe book. It's a robust response to the idea that Rochdale was a town which couldn't produce anything of virtue as long as it had manufacture. This entrance hall was, in essence, an exchange, even if one that wasn't favoured by merchants. The sculpture, though, is exquisite in its detail. And as Ruskin said, any Gothic building worth its salt has got to have variety. It has to have individuality. It has to show the virtue of craftsmen. And here, you see, you see a version of that, which is a hymn to man and nature working as a system to translate wealth into virtue. Crossland had previously designed a few churches, but not much else. So this was a real opportunity for a relatively unknown architect, and he made the most of it. The building went eight times over its 20 grand budget, but as the mayor of Rochdale said at the opening ceremony, we can't have beauty without paying for it. The overwhelming impression of the Great Hall at Rochdale is its extraordinary, exquisite and total decoration. There is no surface untouched by paint or glass or carved wood. The architecture of this thing carries on the theme from downstairs. We've got window types that belong to the years around 1300. Two types, overlapping tracery in the shape of a Y, just up there. Look. And then next to them, 
um, circles at the top of the light. So both of these things appear at about 1300. But the roof is a different beast. Look at that. It's the most audacious piece of borrowing in Rochdale. It is inspired by the Great Hall at the Palace of Westminster. So the last and the most impressive space of the medieval palace of the kings of England. So you've got here the beginnings of an encyclopedia of late medieval English architecture and art. But the thing about Westminster is, of course, it's a royal palace and in the stained glass all the way around. Look, all the monarchs from William the Conqueror in that corner through the medieval kings and beyond into the age of Henry VIII in this corner. Even there's Elizabeth I, even Oliver Cromwell over there is included. They're all there in vivid, vividly characterized, in beautiful colors. To a Victorian eye, this must have been overwhelming when freshly installed. And the relationship that Rochdale had with monarchy is really emphasized on this wall. This is what it's all about. That scene by Henry Holiday is 1215, it's Runnymede, the signing of the Magna Carta, the, the moment when royal power is ceded to parliamentary authority. And after Rochdale became incorporated as a municipal borough, that must have charged it with a sense of empowerment which allowed it to draw on this longer history and claim its place. Now, to bring it all up to date in the age of steamships and, and railway trains and international commerce, you've got two characters. One is down the far end, is Victoria. So there she is, occupying that rose window with the symbols of her queenship and status as an empress. And she is facing right in the eye, the recently deceased Albert. There he is, Prince Consort. And the details around him represent his virtues and interests, the fact that he championed commerce, industry, agriculture, all the things that benefited Rochdale, but also the arts, painting, sculpture, and architecture. And the building that was chosen to emphasize the art of architecture was, of course, this one. Rochdale had thrown down the gauntlet to other towns and cities across the north. Could anywhere top Rochdale's town hall? Well, if there were a contender, it had to be the North's big smoke. In the 1860s, Manchester's town clerk, Joseph Heron, found himself struggling to run Manchester from an outdated building that just didn't have the capacity for the job. Manchester was now a major city, and its town hall needed upsizing. The awkward triangular site meant that a symmetrical neoclassical building was out of the question. Plus, Liverpool already had one of those, and if there was one thing Manchester Council didn't want, it was a style associated with their greatest rival. So they opted for a fashionable Gothic design by local architect Alfred Waterhouse. Waterhouse had won a solid reputation for designing attractive civic buildings that worked. The skill made him the most financially successful Victorian architect. Manchester Town Hall wasn't designed by committee, but it was designed to suit a committee. And Waterhouse made some compromises which Ruskin may not entirely have agreed with. There's no Venetian multicoloured stone here. There's one shade of Derbyshire sandstone. The ornament, which Ruskin said should liberate the craftsman through freedom of choice, is instead quite mechanistic, turned out apparently by the mile only reasonable for a building of this scale. And then there's the symmetry of this facade, more or less. It hasn't fully broken apart in the Gothic way. But all of those apparent compromises are drawn together into a truly majestic design, which would surely have satisfied Ruskin's idea that buildings of power should resemble an overhanging cliff face to take the imagination beyond the realms of practicality and into the sublime. Ultimately, Waterhouse delivered for Manchester a truly magnificent, municipal, Gothic palace. But incredibly, Waterhouse's design, which is now so strongly associated with the city, 
nearly didn't get built. The design for Manchester's Town Hall, like many other civic commissions at the time, was decided by a competition. Well over 100 architects entered, and the designs, assessed on architectural merit, were placed as follows. First place went to partners Speakman and Charlesworth. Second place, John Aldred Scott, with Thomas Worthington in third. And finally, this design, which may look familiar because it's the building that stands today by Alfred Waterhouse. So why on earth did Manchester opt for what appeared to be a second-rate, or should I say fourth-rate, design? Well, the external appearance was only one of the selection criteria. There were other practical concerns too. Now, Terry, perspective views engage the heart, don't they? They represent the experience of seeing a building. And Waterhouse trails amongst the last four. And yet his plan, which is more to do with function, therefore the rational mind, that triumphs. So why was the plan so good? Only one of the criteria actually dealt with the external appearance of the building. The, the other conditions dealt with the internal layout and how the actual building functioned uh, in terms of uh, the, the degree to which natural daylight could be admitted to the building, the way in which the building could be heated and ventilated, to the way in which the workers would circulate, so to speak, within the building. And it was on these conditions that uh, Waterhouse scored above all the other competitors. In fact, he was marked number one on all of those other conditions. If you compare Waterhouse to Speakman and Charlesworth, it's very complex. And, you know, this, this corridor has a bit of a dog leg. You've got anterooms, you've got little offices nibbling away at the corners. It's inelegant, really. Whereas Waterhouse, it's all very simple, isn't it? I mean, the, the way in which he uses these one, two, three staircases to emphasise the triangle, Indeed, and here we see just the first floor of the building, because you've got to remember there were other stories, there was a large basement as well. It's in all of those areas where Waterhouse is coming up with inventive solutions to a difficult space. He was able to uh, solve the different problems of putting perhaps what one might be tempted to say was a modern office block behind that Gothic facade. The practical tag sells Waterhouse short. He was what you might call a modern goth. His design for Manchester Town Hall exploits the freedom and versatility of Gothic, mixing medieval style with modern technology, with brilliant results. It's the side elevations of Manchester Town Hall where Waterhouse can, can break free of convention and really use Gothic to best effect. Here you've got streets emerging from the undercroft of the building with little glimpses through to lost medieval worlds. The windows hang on to the corners or are in big bays going right up to the roof where there are pinnacles that abound. And that variety, the massing, is what makes the best of Gothic. The whole thing culminates in a tower on that south side. It rises by surprise. Little windows just poking out. Could be for the head of the gas board, could be Rapunzel's city bolt hole. But it's inside that you really see the genius of Waterhouse's design. In any grand public building, you expect an entrance hall, a space that's going to guide you to the rooms beyond. But Waterhouse does away with that. Now, if you're going to reject convention, you've got to be pretty clever about what you've put in its place. And Waterhouse was brilliant. What he did on this triangular site is give you a great internal cloister, a triangular corridor with fabulous Gothic vaulting, but which you see on entry has oak doors to what look like committee rooms. This is the stuff then of the council, the practical office business. And yet, although this space is very functional, the Gothic design fills it with craft and beauty. It remains an inspiring place to work.
But if you've come for a grand event here, perhaps in the Great Hall, then your eye is immediately taken by the glorious sculptural staircase right ahead of you with its tall glazed windows. The design cleverly draws you up toward the principal space. For Gothic architects, the Holy Grail was to find the perfect combination of architecture and applied arts. And that's just what Waterhouse was aiming for in the Great Hall, which represents a shrine to Manchester's achievements. This fine room had to achieve two major objectives. The first was to put Manchester on the world stage by comparing it with world cities. And so the ceiling is covered with the names of the great trading nations and some of the cities that Manchester saw as its rivals. And the second aim was to mythologize itself, to underpin that claim to status by drawing on the greatest hits of Manchester's history and telling you how it had become a place not only of Christian nonconformity, but a place of weaving and trading. And that manufacture generated the wealth to invest in its sons, ingenious men of science who would further the cause of civilization. It's a pretty heady mix. The murals are by Ford Maddox Brown, a radical artist known for his social realism, a brave choice for a civic building. And you wonder whether the council knew quite what they were getting. This, to my mind, is one of the most important of Maddox Brown's paintings. It's John Kay, the inventor of the fly shuttle, a piece of mechanised weaving which was going to put the hand weavers out of business. And here they are. Here's the mob. They've arrived at his house saying, well, look, we don't want industrialised processes. What are we going to do for a living if it's all done by machines? Kay then panics in his house in Bury in 1753 when this happened. And he's being wrapped up in a blanket. It's a last kiss to his wife. He's crying children at the door. He's going to abandon them all. But look, down in this corner, the detail shows a Yorkshire terrier standing its ground. It's the virtues of the dog and not of Kay, which are most trumpeted by this picture. Waterhouse's town hall reinforced Gothic as the civic style synonymous with the city. And Gothic remained in use for Manchester's civic buildings even as it fell out of favour in other towns and cities across the north. No expense was spared in the construction of this public library. Its art for art's sake gothic shows just how much the freedom of this style invites individual interpretation. It was commissioned by Enriqueta Rylands as a memorial to her husband, John, a textile manufacturer and Manchester's first self-made multi-millionaire. This building's a real labour of love. Mrs. Rylands dedicated 20 years and much of the two million pounds she'd inherited from her husband to the project. She engaged the architect Basil Champneys to design a building that would house her husband's vast collection of theological texts and provide a free library in a down and out area of the city. In spite of the ancient appearance of the library, its technology was advanced. It had a fire-resistant concrete construction and was one of the first buildings in the city to be lit by electricity. This is as well designed and constructed a building as I've ever seen. Champneys solved the problem of how to store precious books and manuscripts in the grime-laden atmosphere of the north by introducing a pioneering air conditioning scheme. Air was drawn in through moist charcoal filters and then heated so that when circulated, the books would remain at a constant temperature. That clean air would not pass through the glazed bookcases that still serve the same function of keeping dust off the books a century on. 
But more than the practicalities and the exquisite detail that this thing is composed of is its ability to stir the emotions. When you enter this main reading room, you feel you've come across something sacred. This is nothing less than a shrine to learning. When the library opened to the public in 1900, one user noted the pleasant contrast between the sullen roar of Manchester and the cloister quietude of the reading room. But the Rylands Library, though a work of art, is really a building after its time. By the time this fabulous building was finished, Gothic had largely fallen out of fashion as a civic style. The young generation had inherited Ruskin and Pugin's writings and found them to be overbearing with moralistic overtones. But there was one of Ruskin's perspectives which really stood the test of time. Gothic architecture as the vehicle for creative expression on behalf of the designer and the liberation of the craftsman. And look what Champneys has done with this building. Thrilling, new, interpenetrating spaces you won't find anywhere on a historical medieval Gothic building. This is building as sculpture, celebrating craftsmanship and freedom of design. It's ironic that it was Gothic, after all, which offered this flexibility. But by adopting it on its own principles, it was the maker of its own downfall. Once you get rid of the pointed arch, anything goes. Gothic was defined by a lack of rules, by the craftsman's freedom of expression. Is it any wonder, then, that late Victorian architects took things a step further, mixing and matching the Gothic style with elements from other periods? In 1890, the year after Mrs Rylands began this great memorial to her husband, another major northern town was laying the foundations for a civic building that would rival the best Manchester had to offer. During the mid-19th century, Sheffield dominated the British steel industry and the region produced nearly half the entire European output. In comparison with their northern neighbours, the people of Sheffield were a bit slow in getting their town hall off the ground. But when they did, they pulled out all the stops. Sheffield's town hall, completed in 1897, is the absolute epitome of the late Victorian mix-and-match approach. Sheffield Town Hall is quite something. Now, to make sense of its style, we have to start in the Jacobean age in the 17th century, which itself was when England half-absorbed Renaissance ideas from the continent. That was our own native mongrel style. And with mongrels, of course, you can adapt it to how you like. And so those big leaded windows are, are mixed in style like a greatest hits from that century. But being so free means that you can add the ornament you want. You see the workers in a band over the top with their own implements, very much a sculpture of the 19th century. But then when you climb up the tower, past the clock, surrounded in a 17th century cartouche, you come to 14th century church tracery. It seems bizarre, but it's a style the French called flamboyant. Again, it talks of flames and fire. And then you realize why when you get to the very pinnacle of the building, because there is Vulcan holding his hammer aloft, forging the steel from which Sheffield made its money. This eclectic design by the architect Edward Mountford turned Sheffield's town hall into a billboard, advertising the city's strengths to friends and rivals across the north and beyond. This is what I call fruit salad civic. You can throw away the recipe book of historical ornament and instead choose your own fruits, as homely or as exotic as they might be. And by mixing them in any combination, it's still fruit salad after all. The fact that you've chosen them means that you can speak on behalf of your hometown. And what could be a greater gift for a civic building?
At a time when money seemed to be no object, it wasn't just civic bigwigs that got a taste of architectural freestyling. This public swimming pool at Chawton on Medlock epitomizes the sort of pick and mix approach that a Gothic purist like Ruskin would have hated. Victoria Bath is a good helping of fruit salad civic. It doesn't say Bath from the outside. If you took its architectural language literally, it would tell you a story something like this. In the middle of the 17th century, a Dutch merchant somehow builds a house on this site. It suffers from jaundice. The merchant goes on holiday and asks a plumber from Paris, maybe via Samarkand, to fit him with a new bathroom suite. When he returns, he discovers the plumber has over-specified by a factor of several hundred. I don't mean that in a bad way at all. This is a people's palace, an exotic world of Turkish baths, pools and staircases with a generous helping of ceramics and stained glass. There were first and second class baths and a separate pool for women. Public baths were thought to improve morals as well as health, and they also encouraged social cohesion. The Turkish baths allowed men from all walks of life to get hot and sweaty together. The late Victorian period may have reveled in architectural eclecticism, but the Gothic revival had yet to achieve its greatest victory. In the year that saw the end of Queen Victoria's reign, the crowning glory of Gothic would emerge on the skyline of the city where classicism had been king. That city was Liverpool. On the evening of Monday, 17th of June, 1901, Francis James Chavas, the second Bishop of Liverpool, was riding more or less here in a hansom cab when a thought struck him. He saw the magnificence of St George's Hall in the fading sunlight and he thought, you know, this isn't enough. It's an unmistakable symbol of Liverpool's civic pride, but it didn't elevate the moral souls of the people of the city. Liverpool was missing a building. Chavas set about drumming up the support and the cash for a cathedral that would put St George's Hall in the shade. And the local community gave generously. During the first 60 years, two and a half million pounds of public funds were raised. Architects were invited to submit plans for a great Anglican cathedral. To everyone's consternation, the assessors, Richard Norman Shaw and George Bodley, chose the design of a 22-year-old rookie architect, Giles Gilbert Scott. The committee made an excellent choice in Scott, but they hedged their bets by making both Scott and Bodley joint architects. Both men had to sign the issue drawings and they were paid the same amount of money. Inevitably, tensions arose between young Scott, full of ideas, and his older, more experienced counterpart. For Scott, the new cathedral would offer a baptism of fire. Bodley constantly made changes to Scott's design, which the young architect found hard to take, and the cathedral became a tug of love. The Lady Chapel was the first part of the building to be completed in 1910, and it shows the overbearing influence of the older architect. The 
Lady Chapel's not one of those buildings you can feel indifferent to. You either love it or feel claustrophobic. The side aisles have small arches which seem to frame the human figure. They can be a bit cosseting. And above them is swelling detail. Words merging with plant forms, lilies, characters poking their heads out of the walls, swirling timber work. Bodley was a man who loved detail and he took over all of these cherries of the design process which pushed Scott out. Frustrated, Scott tendered his resignation. But at that moment, Bodley dropped dead. Scott was now his own master and returned to work on the cathedral with renewed vigour. And this is what the young man achieved when left to his own devices. Using 20th century materials and techniques, Scott took the load-bearing principle of the medieval pointed arch to its limit, generating an immense sense of height and space. It would always be difficult to design a medieval sort of architecture in the 20th century, an age of lost innocence. Scott, in the absence of cloisters or ancient graves, had to invest this place with its own spirit. Had it been thought of maybe ten years later as World War I approached and Liverpool had peaked, well, this place may never have got off the ground at all. But instead, Scott poured over the details, constantly revised, and came up with thrilling and original concepts. That soaring octagonal tower, the bridge over the nave, and just the right level of dark and shade to create atmosphere. And he gave Britain its last and largest Gothic cathedral. Like his medieval predecessors, Scott devoted his life to the cathedral. He was still working on designs for the nave when he died in 1960, aged 80. It's a memorial to the vision and dedication of those who persevered through troubled times to ensure its completion. And it's a powerful symbol of what we can achieve when we absorb the lessons of the past. It was in the new industrial towns and cities of the north that so many of our ideas about urban life were forged and tested. Their golden age of civic buildings shaped our social consciousness, just as it created the skylines that millions of us have grown up with. And over a hundred years on, we're still living with that legacy. John Ruskin had said, when we build, let us think that we build forever. At the turn of the 21st century, you have to ask, will we ever build the same way again? Stay with us here on BBC Four as Marcus de Sotoy unravels a little more of the story of maths next.